everyone to our Room for Discussion interview with Paul Pullman. Paul Pullman is the former CEO of multinational consumer goods Unilever. He's a leading figure in the world of corporate social responsibility. Um, and since Unilever, he has founded the company Imagine to eradicate poverty, lessen inequality, and help a businesses to act sustainably. Room for Discussion has invited Mr. Pullman to talk about the purpose of big business, corporate social responsibility, and his new project, Imagine. Um, I'm Max Boogaert, and next to me is Sarah Bronkhorst. Welcome, Mr. Pullman, to Room for Discussion. How are you doing? Thanks for having us. It's a wonderful day here in London, so I hope the same is true in Amsterdam. Definitely. It's beautiful out. Um, Mr. Pullman, so many of our students watching, um, or anyone else watching really, uh, knows you mostly from your time at Unilever, I think. They've probably seen you in the news, um, read about your efforts to transform that company. Um, but it's also a fact that we could have also been talking to a famous priest from the Netherlands, looking at that you also wanted to be a priest before, or even a famous doctor, perhaps. So what happened there? Well, I don't know if the word famous is the right thing. I mean, we're all uh, famous in our own respect, so that is not the most important thing in life. But the um, I grew up, I was born in 1956, actually, in Enschede, which is close to the German border. And at that time, I thought this was a really long time after the World War II. But the older I get, the more I realize how close it was after the war. And, uh, you know, all the focus of my parents, who unfortunately, um, my father was 15 when the war started and my mother was even younger, um, um, you know, their education was deprived from them. The, uh, uh, my father was 15, and when the war ended, he was 20. So he lost basically his high school opportunities and, and did not have a pleasant experience. And you certainly don't wish that to anybody. So all their energy went to ensuring that their six children could go to school and have a good education, uh, that the communities would function again, that there was peace in Europe. And often that was around the church and Boy Scouts and all the other activities. So we grew up with a sense of community, a sense of putting ourselves to the service of others, knowing that by doing so, we would be better off ourselves as well. And, and that's how I grew up. So then, uh, you know, my desire to help others was uh, first, uh, obviously, uh, when, when you grew up in the Catholic Church, then there are some elements that stick to you and, and some elements that don't. But uh, it was attractive to me to to uh, to be a priest. I, when I was in school, uh, I was invited all the time for the weddings and the funerals and all the things because they were picking the students that could miss some classes. And that was a very attractive uh, proposition. So I was hanging around there a lot and, and probably it must have rubbed off on me. But I, I decided that that wasn't the course to take. And then I wanted to study medicine. In Holland, as you know, you have your numerous... Uh, fixes. And uh, unfortunately, what you call uitgeloot, I didn't get the lottery ticket uh, two years in a row. And my father made clear to me that I had to do something else to make a living, that he wasn't going to support me for the rest of my life. So that's when I ended up in Groningen, which is a wonderful city. And uh, at that time, other cities, really, there were only two or three universities that offered uh, economics at that time. And uh, and uh, I did that, but I wasn't really motivated, to be honest. I was involved in many other things, except uh, perhaps uh, seeing this as my long-term career. But then my father was suggesting, why don't you just uh, go to the U.S. and improve your English and perhaps uh, work for the company that at that time had bought the company he worked for and, um, you know, get some get some better understanding of what it is to work in business. When I arrived in the U.S., I thought, well, uh, this was a tire company, by the way, in Akron, Ohio, uh, called Goodrich. Mm. So I didn't wasn't too appealing to me to move to Goodrich and and in Ohio, uh, somewhere in the middle of nothing, and work in a tire factory. So I went around to universities there. At that time, I didn't have a visa or I didn't have my grades from Groningen or anything. But fortunately, there was one professor at the University of Cincinnati in economics that said to me, "Okay, if you teach uh, Paul Samuels in 101." If you get uh, straight A's on your first semester and uh, some other things, then I'll offer you an assistantship. So uh, luckily I got that assistantship and then I started uh, doing my MBA and my MA, uh, met my wife. So that was another reason to stay. Mm -hmm. And uh, Cincinnati is the city of PNG. Uh, so it was quite logical as I had had to take a lot of evening courses. I was in 
in um, doing maintenance work to earn money, obviously, to run my car and, and buy some food. And that was a PNG building. So the company was attracted to me and, and I was attracted to them. And that's when I spent my first 27 years in PNG moving around, ending up in running the international business from Geneva, which brought me to Geneva. And then a wonderful opportunity came after when I turned 50, I decided to retire and spent more time on a foundation I had started which to me was actually more rewarding. Didn't yeah. want to go back to Cincinnati for many reasons. But uh, then Nestle came in, asked me to be a CFO uh, for Nestle, which was such a crazy proposition. Uh, that At the time was uh, Enron and Parmalats and everything. I remember my wife being up the whole night. If you become a CFO, you go to jail, but it turned out that <laughs> uh, And then... From Nestle, I ended up having this wonderful opportunity to be for 10 years the uh, CEO of Unilever. Yeah. So, and, uh, tremendous experience. Talking about that period, sorry. Um, it seems that yeah. um, since your time at Unilever, you've become one of the leading figures in promoting corporate social responsibility. And now you spread the word through uh, of, of Caesar uh, around the globe. So, you're also invited to a wide variety of venues to talk about uh, this concept. So uh, the World Economic Forum, even the Pope, the United Nations, room for discussion right now. Um, could you maybe elaborate a bit on what this concept means to you and what it entails? Well, it's very simple. I've always felt that for businesses to succeed long term, they cannot be bystanders in a, in a society that gives them life in the first place. I've always felt that uh, in order to address these worldly issues, and we have many of them, we can talk about that, that business has a broad responsibility. And if you are in a business that makes things worse, then uh, you don't really have a reason to be around. So if you cannot show that you make this a better world, what's the purpose of being there? Um, World Overshoot Day last year was August 22nd, which means that's the day when we use up all the resources that the world can replenish. So you might put it differently that after August 22nd, every day after, we steal from future generations. I don't want to be part of that. I think many businesses don't want to be part of that. So we need to start to generate businesses now that... Uh, that can help repair the damage. Just a circular economy is not even good enough anymore. We need mm -hmm. to really regenerate, restore. Yeah. And if you don't have that mindset, I think you'll be folded out of office fairly quickly. And we see the evidence around us more and more. Business is such an important part of the global economy and, uh, and is also benefiting from societies that function. Uh, if societies don't function, business don't function either. Yes. Uh, so it's an important part that we cannot solve these worldly issues of food security, of poverty, of climate change, of inequality, if we don't have the business community actively participate in that. But then who uh, decides what is responsible? Who decides what is the, the responsible factor of, of that concept? The norms in society will change over time and it will also be a function of where you are in the world that it might be different, but it certainly isn't the right, isn't um, uh, business prerogative to decide what the norms are. The norms are created by society, by political systems that emerge, by, by, uh, by all the actors that are playing a role in society. Uh, but what is very clear is that, uh, that many of the challenges that we have um, are global challenges. Uh, you take the pandemic right now, or you take the uh, climate change, uh, there are no borders there. So we have to solve these things together. And that is what we need to focus on. But then, I'm not advocating for business to dictate on people what is right for business. That's not a good strategy, to be honest. I'm, I'm advocating that business needs to be responsibly serving society and doing that in partnership with society. The famous goal number 17 on the sustainable development goals. Yeah. And what, in, in your opinion, would be the main criteria for a sustainable CEO or leader of a company? Oh, that's a, you can answer that question in a lot of ways. But uh, what we have found during COVID as well is that uh, first and foremost, the best leaders of these companies are, are good human beings. Uh, you know, they, they've realized that putting themselves to the service of others, that uh, long, longer term, they're better off themselves as well. Things like compassion or empathy or humility, humanity, are skill sets that have come to the foreground tremendously. And leaders that have shown a high level of awareness that is going on, but also a high level of engagement to do something about that, 
are leaders that tend to be doing better. Uh, they operate on the truth and trust and 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 build that confidence with their organizations. They, you know, they're humble in that sense. The, you know, the Lee Ayakokas or the Jack Welches or others are leaders of the past. Uh, so these leaders need to be systemic thinkers. They need to understand the complexities that are there in the world and being able to distill that to simple action steps. They need to be able to work in partnership with others, think multi-generational, but above all, probably be very purpose-driven, have, uh, have a strong sense of, of, of uh, to some extent, luck that they are in these positions, uh, high awareness of the responsibility, but as I said, uh, putting themselves to the service of others. If you are in the position of of uh, influence in that sense, it's it's uh, your responsibility, I believe. It's your duty to put yourself to the service of others. Right. Otherwise, you shouldn't take those jobs. If it's only to enrich yourself or to have board power or formal power, uh, it's not a good thing. You know, you need to ultimately in life, the difference will be made with uh, moral power. At the same time, a CEO also cares about economic revenue for its company, right? Because one of the primary objectives of a company is also to generate shareholder value. And you've also That's argued that... that CSR and um, profit or revenue can coexist, right? They might actually um, improve upon one another. Um, but then if you look at the world today, um, Unilever is still the fourth largest uh, plastic producer in the world, for example. And just this week, Shell was ordered by a judge to cut their emissions or um, we're just looking. So where is the evidence if so many companies claim to implement CSR and do CSR reporting? I believe 76% of uh, the largest hundred companies in the United States do now um, CSR reporting. Um, so where's the evidence that business has the capacity to solve these problems? Well, first of all, let me stress uh, two things again before I answer your question. Uh, at no time have I said business is the one that's going to solve the problem. But the reality is that business is 70, uh, sorry, 65%, 70% of the global economy, 80% uh, of the job creation, 90% of the financial flow, uh, you know, to implement sustainable development goals cost three to five trillion dollars a year. Governments in overseas development aid only have 150 billion. So if business doesn't play an active part and assumes a core responsibility, uh, then it is not going to work. Of course, you need functioning governments, you need the right rules and regulations and frameworks, but business has to be an active part in creating that. So that's the one point. So that's very important. Otherwise, we won't get there. And societies where there is a low involvement of business or where there is an absence of private sectors, we've been there, uh, is not very good for the people. No. So, so we need responsible business. The second thing is in your question is that the role of business is to make profit. Is I, I really disagree with that, if I may, may be honest. It's like a little bit of, uh, you, you need white blood cells in your body to survive, but you're not living for white blood cells. So profit is a little bit like white blood cells. You need it to survive to continue to operate. We all understand that. There's nothing wrong with that concept. Unilever's profits went to dividends on our shares, which went to pensioners that need to retire. So uh, profits went to reinvesting in capital to ensure that the factories keep running. So there's nothing wrong with the notion of profit, but you're certainly not going to be alive just to make profit. In Unilever, I entirely focused on making this company successful long-term and touching more people. And then we have enough smart people on the payroll who figure out how to do that whilst ensuring that you survive. And not surprisingly, during my tenure, you saw a 300% shareholder return. You saw every year top and bottom line grow. So there is no uh, trade-off, in my opinion, if you do it well and if you do it uh, smartly. But ultimately, you need to be there to show that you don't make things worse, that you make things better. Right. Otherwise, why would we keep these companies around? No, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I believe that, that Unilever definitely has, has been acting uh, or has the potential to act sustainably and responsibly. But um, on the other hand, it's clear we also see companies like pharmaceutical companies driving up the prices of medicine or claiming patents or investment banks like Lehman Brothers bringing about these, these terrible events like the financial crisis and acting contrary to CSR ideals. Um, well, you, what should we do about these types of companies? And the you have them? individuals that misbehave, you have governments that misbehave, you have uh, charities where we see frauds or child abuse, uh, we have uh, 
religious institutions, uh, and we also have companies where, where there are different moral compasses. That's unfortunately something that society has to deal with, and what we work on is to try to minimize that. You also have norms that change over time, where something that is not considered to be a problem uh, in the past all of a sudden becomes an issue. A plastic in the oceans is a good example. Plastic was probably one of the best inventions, and we were celebrating that across humanity and, and saved a lot of lives with that. But then all of a sudden we find out that if we have linear production models and consumption models instead of circular, and we only reuse 9% uh, of the world's resources that we take out of the earth, and 91% goes into the oceans or landfills or incineration, that's not a good thing. It was, a good, it was manageable when there weren't that many people in the world and consumption patterns were different. But you cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet, and we're starting to see the effects of these planetary boundaries. Were the people stupid not to see that coming? Were there other people that warned us uh, several decades ago? Undoubtedly. But at the end of the day, we now know what the problem is, and the good companies that are there, the ones that we should keep around, are the ones that attack that. Not that they are perfect. I don't think that anybody is perfect. Not one individual is perfect. Not one company is perfect. Mm -hmm. But what we need is these companies that thrive to get to that positive impact. And they cannot do it alone. They really have to work in partnership, sometimes with their value chains, sometimes at industry level, sometimes with broader society, and ultimately you need the governments. Yeah, but also I think um, you also need your, your shareholders. And uh, what we imagine is that the shareholders who are focused on profits and on generating revenue can be quite an obstacle in obtaining these CSR values in your, uh, in your company. So how do you convince short-term focused shareholders of the importance of sustainable business? Unilever had about a million shareholders, and that is a good thing. Many people can buy a share of Unilever, and you're a shareholder. So there is not one shareholder. Some want uh, dividends, and some want uh, growth of the company. Uh, some want uh, your company to be split up. Others want you to buy more things. If you would listen to all those people and satisfy all the shareholders, you'd go berserk, and your strategy would be schizophrenic. So you have to attract the right shareholders. When Unilever stopped doing quarterly reporting and stopped giving guidance, I got rid of the shorter term shareholders that frankly were speculating against the company. And we saw a fundamental change in our shareholder base over time to the more longer term loyal shareholders. You know, shareholders are basically in, in the aggregate um, uh, institutional investors, which are a lot of that is pension money. And, and uh, they don't only want to ensure that the pensioners can retire in 20, 30 years time, but they are also increasingly aware that they need to be sure that there is a world they can retire in. So that's why you see people like BlackRock or Vanguard or State Street or Fidelity or the Japanese investment fund CIIF uh, demanding that companies take action on climate change, uh, demanding that corporations uh, are responsible in, in, on the social side and, and take care of the human rights standards, etc. These have become all high risk factors if you neglect those. And these have become, for the bulk of the um, shareholders, a very important things. Not only from a risk mitigation point of view, which probably got us into CSR. CSR is about less bad than risk management, but increasingly as opportunities for companies to position themselves very well in the future. That's why you see companies like Orsted, uh, who have transformed themselves into green energy suppliers, or companies like Tesla, who are setting the pace for electric vehicles, you've seen their market caps go up incredibly, whilst companies like Exxon Mobiles, the ones that keep their heads in the sand, don't want to be part of this transition, have seen their market caps go down. Yeah. The financial market is catching up. ESG investing is growing very fast. Uh, the green bond markets are growing very fast. So there is movement there at, uh, at a pace we've never seen before, partly driven by governments now setting clearer directions, partly driven by the technology that has developed over the years, mm -hmm. partly driven by the enormous opportunities of this new economy that we need to create. And the alternatives, frankly, aren't there. Look at COVID right now. We don't want to talk COVID in detail, but we've just had a, a horrible year of trying to save lives and livelihoods. We've seen the consequences that people that are already marginalized in society paid again an incredible price for this. The rich got richer, but the poor got poorer. We lost about 15 to 20 years 
on the sustainable development goals. $3.7 trillion was lost by poor people. The billionaires got $3.9 trillion more. Inequality went up further. That's not a system we want to live in. And what we found was we had to spend $16 trillion just to stabilize economies. The GDP loss was about $22 trillion, according to the IMF. And that's about four or five times higher in one year than what it would take us to implement the Sustainable Development Goals. We've come to a point that the cost of not acting is higher than the cost of acting. So more people are aware of that now. Responsible businesses have to help uh, politicians to move things forward. You see in the Netherlands how gridlock politics is. It were also the courts with, with Uganda that had to go to the courts, like in Germany, like in Australia now, like in many other countries, to tell the governments, you know, live up to these standards. And if you can get a good group of businesses together that say the same thing, which is starting to happen now, we can galvanize that change. People know what needs to be done, but we're not moving yet at the speed and scale that is needed. I feel talk- that, that there is this realization for companies um, to be more, yeah, I, I would say maybe woke about corporate social responsibility and aware of it. And what my point of view has already mentioned that 76% of US, the largest US companies produces a CSR report every year. But isn't CSR then just right now a sexy business or a sexy marketing strategy? Well, I don't know if it's sexy or not, and sexy in itself is not necessarily bad. So, so the point is really that people have understood the enormous opportunities, and if they don't do it, then we might just not have a future anymore. We're at that point now. Uh, are we late in the game for many people? Yes. Are we doing enough? No. Do we need to collectively set the bar higher? Absolutely. Uh, 2021 is a year of delivery. We were working very hard to make the COP26 more ambitious. Governments have not shown ambition until now. And then, and yet we need governments to put the right frameworks in place. We still have 500, 600 billion per first subsidies on, on fossil fuel versus encouraging green energy. We still have six, 700 billion per first subsidies in agriculture that destroy the forests of this world that give us degraded land. European cap policy is a good example of that. So we need governments to set their ambitions higher, which is difficult because sometimes it means short-term sacrifices and they're in shorter and shorter cycles. We need businesses to step up. Businesses are incurring enormous costs, increasingly so, of climate change, of inequality, of social incohesion. So fortunately, there are more and more businesses that want to be part of that journey that sometimes set the pace. We would not be able to achieve these objectives were it not for technology, for example. The International Energy Agency in 2014 was forecasting that green energy, wind and solar would have the same cost as fossil by 2050. We've achieved that in 2020. We've achieved that in six years versus 36 years. That's why in 60% of the world now green energy is cheaper than fossil fuel. Right. That's um, a typical example of technology. So you need all of us to work together now at a higher level and at a speed and scale that we haven't seen before to address these issues. We're talking here about really the future of humanity. Definitely. And um, we've seen companies, and as you're saying, companies have to step up, right? Um, but we've also seen that a lot of sustainability reports are only sustainable in, um, in as far as their own definition, right? Or um, MSC, for example, is a sustainable fishing label. I'm not sure if you've seen the documentary Sea Spiracy, for example, and they, they show that these types of labels are far less reliable than they claim to be. And companies actually have the opportunity to pay for such a label, but they're never actually audited for it. Um, many also call this greenwashing, as you as you definitely know. Um, what should we do about this trend? Companies claiming to be sustainable, reporting it, communicating it, but not actually being it. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. And by the way, when these standards were set, uh, Unilever actually started the Marine Stewardship Council for Sustainable Fishery. And these were very progressive standards at that time. Unilever went out of fish, but if these standards don't evolve and the bar is being set higher, then you might get a gap between what is needed and what is reality. And uh, these documentaries bring that level of awareness up uh, significantly. You know, the David Edinburghs have really done the world of these standards higher. There are about 600, uh, over 600 efforts right now on sustainable accounting. There's a consultancy practice booming at 100 miles an hour. 
So there's a field of flowers growing, which is normal when people start to realize that there is an issue, which is very positive. What we now need to do is bring them together and create some bouquets. So Europe, for example, and, and business has been actively involved, again, the responsible business, has put up a taxonomy regulation, is setting standards for the financial market now, what ESG means so that we don't get greenwashing. Um, we are seeing the International Financial Reporting Standard Board, the IFRS, uh, setting up a sustainable standard board. So as these things create higher awareness, we also need to create a transparency on what reporting looks like and an accountability and a responsibility and an accountability. Yeah. So you'd say that these that these documentaries, they contribute to, to the changing norms of society because ultimately it comes from awareness from the consumer, but then there should be an equal playing field of the companies and the corporations who actually, yeah. Absolutely, and I wouldn't say uh, to the changing norms, it's probably the, the changing awareness. Yeah. And so these things are good things. And, and by the way, we financed a lot of them, we've produced some of them, and we're certainly promoting actively many of them uh, because they're good things. They bring people that have become increasingly isolated because we're all sitting behind our computers and we've all moved to cities. An average kid doesn't know the difference anymore between an aubergine and a cucumber. <laughs> and and uh, we don't talk to each other anymore. We like little likes on computers, but we don't have a real friend to talk to, mm -hmm. to have deeper discussions. Yeah. So these documentaries are one way, not the only way, but they're one way to create that higher level of awareness. No, I completely agree. We need to unlock our consciousness. To so do something. talking about these, these deeper discussions, we'd also like to touch on a more fundamental issue. Because um, there seems to be a tension between individuals and corporations in trying to do good. Um, this can also be seen in the discussion of philanthropy versus taxes, for example. You've signed a letter called uh, Millionaires Against Pitchforks in the Patriotic Millionaires uh, Spheres, in which you favor for higher you favor higher taxes for the rich. Why do you think this is important? So, for example, I've actually just put an op-ed in Fortune uh, this week. I think mm -hmm. it came out today or yesterday, yeah. uh, really uh, supporting a uh, tax uh, average tax rate as well. Um, Europe now has uh, tried to seek a compromise with the US for a 15% tax rate with the OECD. Uh, I was advocating a 21% tax rate. In fact, I was one of the few CEOs in the world, I think I'm probably the only one, who continuously pointed out to people that the fact that Unilever was paying 24, 25% tax every year during my tenure was a good thing. I was proud to pay the tax. Yeah. The tax goes to education so that we can hire the right people that we have an infrastructure, that we have peace and justice, that hopefully we have clean air and many of the other things. So if we don't fulfill our responsibilities there, again, once more, society doesn't function. You cannot, uh, you know, Amazon has, has uh, paid uh, a 2.5% tax over all their earnings since, they, since their existence. Uh, and yet they, they hire the people, they, they use the roads, they, all the other things. Mm -hmm. You know, you cannot, you cannot consider yourself responsible if yeah. you don't contribute yeah. to creating this world that we can all live in. And that's the same for inequality. The world doesn't function if too many people feel that they're not participating or are being excluded. Uh, the social cohesion aspect is the most important thing to make societies function. If it doesn't there, it undermines democracy. Look what has happened in the U.S. The issue in the U.S. has not been Trump. Trump has been a symbol of the issues that were not addressed. Mm -hmm. He was a very visible symbol. Yeah. Some of you might have made it worse. Yeah. But the reason they, these people get elected, and you have populism, xenophobia, um, nationalism, which every country suffers from right now, including the Netherlands with people like Wilders and some others, is because we don't address these fundamental issues and the populists play on that. So people that have a high net worth that have been lucky, that have benefited from a system that rewards capital versus labor, and as long as that system doesn't change, these people have to contribute disproportionately to ensure that the system functions. Mm -hmm. You cannot have these little islands of prosperity each time with higher and higher walls on them in a growing sea of poverty. It just doesn't work. We, we always need to fight for some basic values to save, save humanity or save democracy, if you want to. Yes. One of them is dignity and respect for everybody. One of them is equity, mm -hmm. which is what we're talking now. Yeah. And the other one is a certain level of compassion. Otherwise, it doesn't work. I think one group that... Of obviously caused lots of outrage, of outrage was the um, move to 
eliminate the dividend tax. And um, what people could, I imagine people would, would say that this may, might be a move away from the stakeholder model that you're promoting. Could you maybe elaborate on why this move was necessary at the time? Well, I think this whole thing became political. And as a result, in the, the way that you ask your question as well, you can see that there is a total misunderstanding of the public. The, uh, the, um, the question really uh, is, is uh, the following. When uh, companies earn money in, in, uh, globally, um, then the uh, tax is paid by uh, countries and, and should be paid where these companies operate then it is totally theoretical that you bring that you consolidate in the Netherlands or in the UK and pay dividend to the shareholders. If a country like the Netherlands then takes again tax from all these uh, after-tax earnings from all these countries and taxes it again, uh, which has nothing to do with the Netherlands or income generated in the Netherlands, a lot of shareholders will find that uh, not acceptable. In the UK, for example, there is no dividend tax. In the Netherlands, for a long time, there was a... Uh, an understanding that the dividend tax would be abolished. In fact, they reduced it over the years, but then they sort of stopped. So it is not something for Unilever. I've always advocated to the government that you need to have the right tax system. I've always said to the government, we don't want lower income tax. We actually are happy with higher income tax instead of this race to the bottom that companies do. The Netherlands is one of the biggest tax havens in the world. So, uh, you know, they, they were on the gray list even of the European Union. Many companies have convalescent structures to, between the Netherlands and Ireland to avoid taxes. It's still happening today. What I was advocating for is get the right tax. If you want the Unilever as a company to stay in the Netherlands, our shareholders, individual shareholders, which are many people, are never going to afford to pay tax in the Netherlands when they haven't paid tax before. And that is exactly what happened. We, we did not get the agreement from our shareholders to just start paying tax. Mm -hmm. You would not go to a store where your products are all of a sudden twice more expensive than the same product next door. That's why you shop at Aldi and Little as well instead of at, an, at one or another store. The shareholders do the same thing. Why should they pay the Netherlands? And frankly, um, so what we were advocating for was instead of the Netherlands reducing the, in, uh, the corporate tax, which was a proposal, reduce the corporate tax a little bit less but don't have the um, dividend tax, which, by the way, foreign companies don't pay in the Netherlands. You compete with a lot of foreign companies that pay their dividends from somewhere else. They don't pay dividend tax. Why should you be at a competitive disadvantage? It's not good for the country. Now they've lost Unilever. They've consolidated in the UK, which was the easier option to do. We needed less of our shareholders to approve. So we've lost another multinational. It's a sad case for the Netherlands. Yeah. And, and basically for what? For political nonsense, to be honest. So in this case, shareholders are, of course, then profit-oriented, so they don't want to pay an extra tax. But do you think this is an, an issue in general? Because we've also seen um, this year with Danone, the CEO was ousted um, by activist shareholders um, for not making enough profit with the company. Um, but many blame that because of the sustainability goals that he set for the company. Um, do you think this is an, an issue of activist shareholders only being profit oriented, either with the dividend tax or with um, going against the CEO that actually wants to change the non to a more sustainable company? Um, first of all, many people pay tax. I do on dividends. You pay income tax, so you, you do pay tax. So it's not that right. people don't want to pay tax. I'm very happy to pay tax. I'm very fortunate to be able to pay tax. So that, that assumption is not to be generalized. Um, um, the fact that you have companies like um, uh, 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 instances like Danone, where the CEO uh, had to leave, uh, he happened to be a very good CEO, but uh, he got into a disagreement with the board and the board decided to change, not the activist, by the way, it's the board that decided, because yeah. the board appoints the CEO, and that is what happened here. It's regrettable. I don't know all the, diff the the instances, but you know, a company still needs to be in the right category, still needs to build market share, uh, still needs to run their company well. And that is the case under ESG or non-ESG. But what you overwhelmingly now see that is that companies that run their businesses under a longer term multi-stakeholder format, putting purpose at the core, are companies that tend to do better. 
just Capital looked at a study of a thousand companies and found a 30% higher return. We certainly found that the case in Unilever. But then what went wrong with the loan? Because the loan um, is, is there and has changed their CEO. Uh, I can give you thousands of companies that have changed their CEOs because they were not compliant with ESG principles. In fact, for the first time, more CEOs have left their jobs for non-financial reasons. Uh, and it's not only sexual harassment. It's because of underperformance on ESG. You look at the Boeings or the GEs or the Wells Fargo's or the KPNs in the Netherlands or others that were purely run at certain times for shareholder value. They've not done very well. And I think increasingly people understand that that model, call it the Milton Friedman model, has run its course. doesn't mean it's black and white. You can always find companies on either side that either do well or don't do well you know, within that equation. But broadly, that is now the case. People see that companies that are more purpose-driven attract uh, uh, more employees. Unilever attracted 2 million people a year to uh, the third most looked-up company in LinkedIn after Google and Apple. Most of these people, <laughs> young people, were applying because of the, the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, as we call it, which was the purpose model. These companies tend to have a higher engagement, so they get more energy in, and people get more energy they're going to work when most of these companies sap energy. These companies attract better partnerships because they have a higher level of trust. Now, for the first time, different when I started, when I had a lot of skeptics and cynics to deal with, but now we have hard facts. We measure quite a lot of things mm -hmm. that show that companies that are more gender diverse perform better. Not yeah. surprising, but sad that we need to get the data to convince people. We also see that companies that take climate change more seriously, perform better. We also see that companies that take more, uh, uh, pay more attention to labor standards in their value chains or human rights standards, etc., are companies that are more resilient. So increasingly we have the evidence, overwhelming evidence, I would argue, I would argue that that type of a business model is better for society than the one we came from. Right, and we're almost moving to your new efforts with Imagine, trying to get other companies and CEOs to act more sustainably and responsibly. I want to get into one more, like, kind of more practical question. So, uh, for example, um, Greenpeace has highlighted the massive amounts of plastic that, for example, Unilever produces, but also Nestle and um, Coca-Cola, for example. Um, so, are there principles or models that a CEO or a company should use to weigh these environmental harms on the one hand, but also societal benefits that these products create? For example, you've always said like hygiene and sanitation are extremely important, especially in the developing world, but they also create plastic pollution. That's kind of a fact. Are there principles or models for us to weigh these type of things? Oh, absolutely. And by the way, what you are talking about is the challenge of any decision you make. It's always a trade-offs in right. any decision. Uh, sometimes you need to close a factory in, in one part of the world or your products have changed and you just don't sell anymore and you open them in the new ones. Uh, where you create new jobs, it's a good thing. Where you close the factory, it's a bad thing. So as a CEO, you always make these tougher choices and, and the choices come to you because they're clearly not easy to make. Otherwise, people below you would have made mm -hmm. them. Uh, plastics were a very good thing. We, we, are, we shouldn't demonize plastic in itself. Plastic has a lot of good things and a good reason for being. But we need to put systems around it so that we also take care of the downsides, in this case, the planetary boundaries. We cannot just have a single-use plastic that it hangs around for, for hundreds of years, sometimes longer, or that ends up in the oceans and in the, in, in the fish and, and again in the human chain and causes uh, all the other issues that we talk about. We have to be sure that we are mindful of, of what we work. For Unilever, that meant creating the Ellen MacArthur Circular Economy Institute and working with her and others now and broader companies to reduce the plastic. During my tenure, we've reduced plastics, the use of plastics by about 40%, whilst the company itself grew over 50%. Um, so we are looking at uh, circular economy systems. In Europe, we worked very hard at that time with Potoshnik, who was the commissioner of the circular economy. Europe has now put a circular economy package in place uh, thanks for working closely with companies like ours and others so that we have the right frameworks and legislation. I'm now working that with Indonesia and some of the other countries that are key polluters. Mm -hmm. We need to find alternatives to plastic. It is unfortunately um, sad that it's cheaper to produce a bottle from new plastic than to recycle it. That's how efficient or, or cheap it has become. 
but we cannot afford to dump all these bottles. Yeah. So yeah. we have to move different incentive systems in the value chain to change that behavior. We've done that with aluminum, where most of it gets now recycled. We haven't figured that out yet on plastics. Yeah. Yet it should be easy to do by putting a tax on polymers or monomers, for example. It's a very concentrated industry that produces that. So these are systems changes that need to happen that normally don't happen alone because countries cannot do it alone. Companies cannot do it alone. Yeah. No company individually can solve the issues of plastics in the ocean. No, that's very yeah, true. And efforts. we and this feel is that there's... We feel that there's also um, a large awareness or at least a very thorough aware awareness at the consumer that um, it's also, you know, our responsibility to try and to, uh, to, to yeah, make incremental changes to uh, the plastic problem or to climate change. And I want to address a famous Dutch slogan, a better milieu begins by yourself, a better environment starts with you. Um, and through documentaries like Seaspiracy um, and articles and papers, etc., the consumer is continuously asked to buy responsibly while the producer uh, continues to produce irresponsibly. Um, why don't we see a mentality of a better milieu begin by the producent or a better environment starts with the producer mentality? Oh, I think it's both. You need to, the push and the pull. So it's not just one or the other. I yeah. think everything at the end of the world, even in companies, is individuals. Companies are made up by individuals. I always felt myself to be an individual, not a robot being a CEO of Unilever. So my awareness of things and my my inner purpose to try to do something about it is as important as yours or, you know, both of you in that sense. So it is the individual that makes a difference. It is now it's individuals that have forced Exxon to take other people on their board to tackle the issue of climate change. It's individuals that have sued Shell to be more aggressive and achieve the, the reduction targets by 2030. Right. It's individuals that have sued the German government to be more aggressive, or the Dutch government. Or the Dutch government, for that matter, of course. Also, individuals make the difference. This world is made up of individuals. Companies are made up of individuals. They're not static things. And sometimes these individuals have a higher awareness. Sometimes they have a lower awareness. Sometimes they're more conscious. Sometimes they're less conscious. But sometimes they see the power of working together. Sometimes they run away from it. And we just need to get collectively in this better behavior. Obviously, it would help if consumers would have a pool on some of these things. Companies are not stupid. They want to be around. They want to attract young people. They want to sell products to the next generation. And if that generation doesn't buy it anymore because they all become vegan or vegetarian, then it's not a good thing to be in the meat business. <laughs> you need to change it. Yeah. So consumers can give a good signal in so terms of... Of course, there, there are, there is a large group of consumers who can give a good signal. You address veganism and vegetarianism that's becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, even Unilever uh, 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 purchased the vegetarische slager with Jaap Korteweg. But still, there is a large group of consumers that might not have the same information um, um, as, as these, most of the time, highly educated people who are aware of, of their... Or the uh, means to pay for these types the of means, products. Exactly. So yeah. how not that like a more fundamental issue that, um, that we have to tackle before we get to the to the whole responsibility thing of consumers? Well, there are many issues. Some people care about water. Some care about poor people and labor standards in the value chain. Some care about climate change. Some care about packaging. It's not that we all care about the same things. And even if we care about 10, 15 things, we're not able to weigh it. We're not able to put a, a number on it to get to one decisive conclusion. So you, it's not that easy for that. So there is a movement with consumers that is certainly accelerated where they are looking at more responsible buying. The B Corp corporations and their actual active uh, growth of these uh, companies is a good example of that. We saw in Unilever being more responsible with our products, our products that have a bigger purpose, that we're addressing these issues better than others, where, comp where products that we're doing better. So there's, there's increasing evidence that it is a good thing to do and that consumers can influence that with their choices. Consumers can also influence who they elect in, in the polls and uh, consumers can uh, get together on advocacy. Uh, so there are many things that consumers can do. Don't underestimate that. And you don't need to be uh, just intelligent or not. You, you, you just need to be passionate or caring. And it, by the way, happens in all countries. We find people in the emerging markets from all the research we continue to do more aware and more eager to have things changed than, than in some of the more Western markets where a certain level of comfort or complacency has come in. Mm -hmm. So it, it is not related to education. 
uh, people that are in, in uh, developing markets are more aware of the effects of climate change than many of us who have built up a certain resilience or adaptation. So the, the, the point here is you need all these factors because the change that we need to make in society is of such magnitude that nobody can do it alone. Let's talk about that change, um, because one of the ways you've been trying to mount CSR or RSC, Responsible Social Companies, is through your new foundation called Imagine. Uh, you founded it and now you're the chair. Let's talk about it. Um, but first, you can definitely hardly say that you've entered retirement and you're also known to dislike that word a lot, right? Being retired. Why is that? Well, as a joke, it's uh, retired sounds that you were tired before and that you're now tired again. And that's how <laughs> people, um, so, so uh, I, I don't think anymore people retire in that sense. Some people might, but they still then start ending up doing other things. They're not going to sit in a, in a chair and looking out of the window. Uh, I'm in a position right now to, uh, with the network that I've built, with the reputation that is there, with the knowledge that uh, is given to me, that I'm in a position to do something about addressing many of these issues and overcoming some of the bottlenecks. We've talked here about behavior, corporate behavior, which are individuals, individual behavior. And, and people, in essence, if you look at uh, Rutger Bregman's book, uh, Humankind, uh, people, in essence, are good human beings. I believe that. We all have a diamond inside of us that we need to make shine. And, and when we do that, we are brilliant. And there are many examples of that. But collectively right now, we're not delivering on the challenges that are being given to us. So why is that? Uh, there's no CEO who wants more unemployment. There's no CEO who wants more air pollution. There's no CEO, at least I haven't met, who wants more people to go to bed hungry. Yet collectively, we're not delivering on these challenges. And that is because the boundaries that are put around us to a great extent drive our behavior. And if you're an individual CEO, it's very difficult to attack that. As we talked about, an individual CEO cannot move the world to regenerative agriculture or cannot solve the issues of plastic in the ocean or, frankly, labor standards in many parts of the world or human rights standards. But collectively, we can do that. Now, the challenge is if one company like Pepsi wants to do something, Coke doesn't want to participate. A CEO might not have the time or the knowledge on how to do this. You need frameworks and standards. So what Imagine works on is on the theory of change, which is very simple, that if we get across a value chain by industry sector, about 20 to 25% of the CEOs in the room, we can actually create a critical mass for tipping points. We then work with civil society and governments to put the frameworks in place to ensure that we get lasting change. So what you see when these CEOs come together is that they collectively become more courageous the targets they set will become bolder and bigger. They're moving from playing not to lose to playing to win. We work on them on two levels, on the human transformations, trying to bring this higher level of consciousness there to change humanity, but also on the systems transformations. So, for example, we put uh, in fashion with the fashion pact. Fashion is a very destructive industry. Um, uh, uh, my main goals are climate change and inequality, just to be clear. Fashion, actually 46% of the plastic in the oceans comes from clothes, uh, microfibers. Really uh, the, the main cause, not the plastic bottles we see, although that's obviously more visible. Um, they are uh, destruction of biodiversity, the way uh, cotton is produced, the labor standards in, in fashion. So it's an industry that uh, with fast fashion and the consumption patterns has a lot to answer for. But it's difficult for each individual company to really change that. So now we've created with 78 companies across the value chain, we have created what is called the Fashion Pact. And with the CEOs of these companies, we're moving to regenerative cotton. We're getting out of single-use plastic that requires different standards in the industry. All of these companies have agreed to uh, internalize the Paris agreements to be net zero by 2050. These are big changes in industries that uh, don't happen if we just let the current system continue at the pace it is. So we are accelerators, if you want to, on trying to implement the sustainable development goals. Will we solve all of the world's problems? No, that would be pretentious. But I think we are a little piece of that. And I've moved from formal authority, being a CEO of Unilever, to probably moral authority, my ability to convene these CEOs, my contacts with the governments. and 
the institutions. I'm an advisor to the COP26. I work with governments from France to Indonesia and others. We work with Franz Timmermans on, on Europe and try to see if we can accelerate. So these connections and these networks that we have is a very important thing to accelerate the industry. That's why I positioned myself as I used to be the chair of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. I currently chair the UN Global Compact. I was the chair of the ICC, the B team I chair currently. These are all business networks that I've put together and worked towards to actually put in the middle of this to accelerate that change. If we don't do that, then we would be unfortunately facing the next COVID crisis right. in less than 10 years time. Um, we also know that you've been working um, on a new book. Um, is, is the content of that book kind of what you try to, to communicate to the CEO, CEOs through Imagine? Um, I believe it's called Net Positive. Um, is that like a handbook for these CEOs of how to act sustainably or responsibly? Could you tell us something about that? It's more than CEOs. I think it's a book that could be read and used by everybody. But it's obviously written from my experience with the role of the private sector, but I think it would apply to anybody. Uh, the idea is really less bad is not good enough anymore. And that's what CSR is. We need to move to R. So CSR is corporate social responsibility. We need to move to RSC, responsible social corporations. And what does that mean? How do you transform your company from at best becoming less bad to actually becoming a positive force in society? And there are some things that need to be done. Uh, a longer term focus, um, uh, full responsibility of your total handprint in society. Many companies th think they can outsource their supply chains and also outsource their responsibilities. That doesn't work anymore. A uh, multi-stakeholder model where you optimize the return to stakeholders versus maximize the return to shareholders. Uh, shareholder value being a result of what you do, not an objective of, of uh, you being. And then companies that are participating in what we just talked, these broader transformative changes to drive the true systems changes. These are net positive companies. And increasingly, we have a subtitle that says how to thrive by giving more than you take. So these are the type of companies that I think we need to put, position ourselves towards in the future. And then we tackle in the book, not only this transformation, which is a human transformation, because we need the leadership and the courage to do that. Uh, which is very important, and it's the systems transformation. So this book actually covers uh, that. It's not an autobiography. It's not just a Unilever story, but it is really a peek around the corner of what we need to prepare for and how to do that to be successful in the future. And then we don't shy away from tackling some of the tougher issues of corruption, of money in politics, of tax, and the, and, and the needs to pay these things that I've been focal about many times. Uh, trade associations, that they don't say a different thing than what the companies publicly say. So we're tackling these tougher issues. So I hope it will be of help to people to become better leaders. I hope it will be of help to people to work better in these more transformative partnerships and ultimately that it contributes to accelerating the changes that we need in society. So it's with Harvard Press. It's coming out in September. Uh, we've already uh, started the pre-sales and it's going very well. There's definitely a need for it, and it's the right time. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. But that's just a small contribution as a result of COVID being at home. Right. Um, so the term net positive, we haven't been able to read the book yet. But um, in very simple terms, that almost sounds to me as if a company can do bad as long as they compensate it somewhere else, like net positive, like a utilitarian type of mindset. Is that right? Or, or should I look at that differently? No, that is a... A narrow term that comes a little bit from the discussions going on now with climate change. Right. Um, you know, in everything you do, there are trade-offs. And some of, you know, I built a school to educate children. It's a good thing. But the cement of the school is a CO2 emitter. But education is a right. very good thing. Yeah. So then you start to be in a, in, a, in, a, in a cement company. What can you do to have carbon absorbing cement? So that's a good thing. But then the carbon absorbing cement needs to be made and some of that will come from minerals and mines and that are not renewable. How do you ensure that? Mm -hmm. So there are trade-offs in every model and what you try to do is make the total work that sometimes my small negatives might be your pluses so that ultimately we move forward. Sometimes it's over time. The beauty of a multi-stakeholder model is that many of these burning issues 
you cannot solve all at the same time. In Unilever as well, sometimes the shareholder benefits a little bit more in a 12 months period. Sometimes your employees, sometimes your customers, sometimes your, your partners in the value chain. So being able to balance that to move forward, net positive. Net positive ultimately means, as the book will describe, that we have a world that is being restored, that we live in harmony with planetary boundaries, that we address the issues of inequality, and that we can live happily for generations to come. So that's the definition. Yeah. So you already touched on the, uh, the, 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 the phrase that CEOs are basically good people. No CEO wakes up one day and, and thinks, oh, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to contribute to climate change or uh, I want the planet to suffer through our operations. But um, they do, most of CEOs do have a certain profit generating um, uh, mindset in the back of their mind. And the way to get there is, might be through contributing to climate change. So what do you, what do you specifically mean with this? And how could you also like, um, yeah, also think through that it is not, not only their mindset that they want, that they don't want to contribute to climate change, but it could be through their operations. Well, Sarah, some, somehow in your question, you imply that to make profit must be bad somewhere and that must result in in in, um, in attacking the planetary boundaries or human rights or other things. That's not necessarily the case. Um, the duties of a corporation, first and foremost, if you look at corporate governance, is to ensure the continuity of these corporations. And you need a certain level of profit to ensure that continuity. How that profit is being used is important. If it's being used to enrich a few people more, and we create more billionaires, it doesn't serve anything. But if we use these profits to do more good, uh, that's a very good thing. In Unilever, a brand like Lifeboy, which is hand washing, uh, fights infectious diseases, helps a child reach the age of five, uh, has many programs to reach a billion people with hand washing that cost money. We generate the profits to be able to do more and reach more people to solve that problem. Of course, that's but I think point. that's 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 one that's one uh, example. I mean, if you take a look at the, for instance, the tobacco industry, I don't think that any CEO of, of a of a of a tobacco firm wants people to suffer. But still, through their operations, um, it does happen. So I don't think that industry should be around. So that, there you have governments. <laughs> I that think we agree regulate. on that. There you need governments that need to regulate. But governments get so much income from the tobacco industry that they refuse to regulate. That's why we have groups of people trying to tell governments to move forward just like we tell governments to move faster on climate change. Ultimately, you have free riders. You have people always in any system that try to abuse it or turn it into for their own advantage and let society deal with these externalities. That will always be there unless you get the right frameworks around it or regulations. But what we see now is that we have a, enough of a critical mass of companies that we can bring together that are... Uh, helping governments de-risk some of these decisions they need to take and, and as a result be able to move faster. Look at the Netherlands, for example, when we got COVID and there were a lot of companies that needed bailouts. It was the private sector that had to tell the government, make these bailouts conditional. Uh, be sure that these companies that you give money, that they pay tax, that they decarbonize in line with Paris Agreement. Don't spend your money on companies that make it bad that caused COVID in the first place, directly or indirectly. So we need to work together to get this because it's not so simple for any individual to point at them and say, hey, you're good, but you're bad. Or why don't you do this? Uh, because it's so obvious that others pay the price for it. There are many of these major issues that we really need to lift up in a level of partnership that we probably haven't seen before. The same partnership that gave us the COVAX vaccine was in 12 months. Right. Uh, so, so we know how to do it. We, know, we, we have, have seen many examples of that. And increasingly, you have a new generation of leaders that is more purpose-driven. We are more aware of the cost of these failures. We have technology. We have the young generation shouting and screaming for it. Put these elements together. And I think we can drive to that higher level of consciousness that is needed to, to solve these issues, not by denying them, not by being defensive about them, but by collectively solving what clearly individually we've not been able to do. Speaking about this, this young generation, and, and we're kind of rounding up here. Um, so a lot of economics and business students are watching right now, but also students from other disciplines. 
Is there any life lesson or lesson from your career or the work that you're doing right now that you would like to tell these students that are watching for their coming career or their academic career right now? Well, I didn't realize it when I was young. You have a lot of these objectives and you want to climb up the Maslow hierarchy. But for example, um, when I was born in the Netherlands, I had food from the day I was born. I didn't have to deal with stunting. 160 million children every year are stunted because they don't get enough nutrition in the first uh, thousand days of their lives. I had food at home. I never went to bed hungry, at least I don't recall. And uh, yet 800 million people go to bed hungry, not even wondering if they wake up the next day. I had free education from the Dutch government. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been sitting here talking to you, etc. I had a piece of bar soap. I didn't die before the eights of five of infectious diseases like pneumonia, diarrhea. So what did I do for that? Nothing. I was just darn lucky to be born in the Netherlands. So I won the lottery ticket of life. Now, unfortunately, the reality is that in this world that we live, only 5% of people won the lottery ticket of life. It's all the students that are listening in that are fortunate to be self-educated, that probably have a choice of where they're going to work, what they're going to do, where they're going to live at a standard and quality of life that is better than the other 95% of the people in the world have nowadays. So if you have your, won your lottery ticket of life, it is your duty, it is your responsibility to put yourself to the service of others. And the moment you realize that putting yourself to the service of others is ultimately also better for you, that's the moment that you become a great leader. It's the Dalai Lama who said that if you seek enlightenment just for yourself to enhance your own uh, causes, you miss purpose. Yeah. But if you seek enlightenment to help others achieve their causes, you are living a life with purpose. My simple message, to all of us is live a life with purpose. Mm -hmm. Would this also be your your maybe your la final preach of hope for the final decade, or do you have any any final things um, you want to yeah you want to address regarding a hopeful message for the coming decade after COVID? Oh, I'm very optimistic because I think a lot of things are converging that we can capitalize on, and this definitely has to be a decade of delivery that we talked about. But the combination of the young people who are far more purpose-driven, a desire to, to be part uh, uh, and have a seat at the table, the technology that has, uh, uh, is accelerating at a pace we've never seen before, the uh, governments getting a higher level of awareness uh, to tackle these issues. Uh, most importantly, the cost of not acting being now higher than the cost of acting. So even companies that don't have this moral compass that want to pursue single-mindedly profits would now come to the conclusion that it is better to operate this way. These are all factors that are coming together. We're also seeing the geopolitical environment being slightly better, still very tough. Many of these issues need global cooperation that doesn't exist, institutions that are too old. But with the Biden administration coming in, the European government moving forward, we're seeing a certain momentum around the world. So the stars are aligned, and we need to collectively now work uh, on, on accelerating that by putting the interest of the common good ahead of our own. If we are able to muster that courage, which comes as much from the heart as it does from the brain, then I think I, I will continue to be very hopeful for the future. Uh, I was on a panel with Desmond Tutu um, a few years ago, and he was asked if he was an optimist or a pessimist, and he simply answered, I'm a prisoner of hope, and that's also the answer I'd like to give you. I will continue to be a prisoner of hope. Wow, I think um, that's a beautiful ending to our um, really interesting discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Paul, for um, for having this discussion with us. Thank you, everyone, everyone for watching. Uh, this afternoon, make sure to tune in our Lala Ghoul interview at uh, 3 o'clock, I think it is. 3 o'clock, yeah. Um, the writer of the book, Ik Ga Leven. Um, it's, you can find it on our website um, or on our Facebook page. Well, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, we hope to one day see you in real life here in Amsterdam for, for an interview on our stage. Um, Hopefully we can uh, invite you again when uh, the universities are open again. I look forward to that. Nothing better than a real hug versus a virtual hug. I exactly. completely agree. Okay, thank you so much. And hope to see you soon. Thanks right. for the opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.